Welcome to the 19th episode of Cartoon Avatars. I'm your host, Logan Bartlett, and I am joined today by recurring co-hosts, Zach Weinberg and Packy McCormick. How are we doing, guys? Doing well. Doing well. Packy, we got we got so close last week, and uh, then I, I kind of blamed it on you uh, for not joining. It was actually uh, really me telling you not to join, and then, but we, we blamed it on you being afraid to face Zach's crypto uh, skepticism here. I heard. I listened. I mean, I'm a, a huge fan of the pod, so I was listening to the pod, and I was getting called out in second second one. So it was a, it was a good episode, though. I was wondering. You, I was, you and the other four listeners really found this. It's really good. You're getting blown on Twitter right now a little bit. Everyone's loving the pod. Yeah, I uh, last week was a big. People like the Parker Conrad uh, interview. He, uh, I don't know why he sat on uh, on all that stuff and just decided to to tell the story from his perspective with me. I think I give off a very warm kind of nurturing vibe, and I really uh, I really worked him into it. But uh, yeah, that was that was entertaining. It was really good. All right, let's do what what we've been what what we've been waiting now eight days or whatever to do. So, uh, crypto this week. So, two separate things I think were big in the news here. The first is Solana, which I uh, purchased a fair amount of, um, thanks to uh, none other than our friend Packy McCormick. Here uh, was down um, two days ago for six hours, and the price is down. I think I don't know, eight, Packy. You probably know better than me, but eighty percent or something. Uh, from the all-time highs. Uh, and then uh, Coinbase, they just announced today they were uh, pausing new hiring and rescinding accepted offers as well, which is kind of uh, kind of wild that, that they're going back on offers that have already been accepted. And then the last crypto thing in the news was uh, that they are actually um, filing charges against Nate Chastain, who was, I think, the VP of product at OpenSea, uh, the NFT platform and charging him with wire fraud and money laundering in connection with trading on confidential information about which NFTs were going to be featured on OpenSea's homepage. Uh, so three kind of crypto things in the news. We can take them in, in any order, but Packy, maybe maybe we'll bat off with Solana here. What the fuck is going on right now with uh, with our, our friends over at Solana? I mean, it's a, clearly a bug in the durable non-transactions feature, which led to non-determinism when nodes generated different re results for the same block, preventing the network from advancing. That was on the tip of Zach's tongue as well. Yeah. No, that makes that sense. sense. Makes sense. That's what they teach you. In yeah, yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. So, all right. So next next question. No, I mean, I mean, I think this has been, I think this has been the, you know, over the past months and, and even kind of since I wrote that piece, the, the, one of the main critiques that this thing goes down, it's become this joke, like, you know, crypto is 24 seven, but Solana is nine to five. Like it's, it's something that people make fun of it for you had plenty of chances to get out of, I think like a triple from where we first uh, talked about it. And when I, when I wrote about it and, and never financial advice in, in not boring. But I mean, I think to me, like the, when I wrote about, when I wrote that piece, like the thing that had gotten me excited about Solana and the thing that I think continues to get me excited about Solana is just the amount of developers choosing to build there. And like, that's been the make or break question. I just got an email from one of my Solana based portfolio companies today that like had had a blowout 100% kind of growth month and obviously off a small early base. Uh, but projects on top seem to be doing well. If these outages are starting to crush them, then like people move and, and the L2s happen, uh, you know, they move to an L2 or the ETH merge happens and actually like everything goes swimmingly there and you just move off Solana because it's not worth it. Like that's the bear case here. But other than these outages, which is a big other than. I don't think the kind of like question change, which is like, they're a platform, can they attract developers who attract users or not? And they are kind of faster and cheaper than the other, the other L1s. What were the critical need use cases that we were unable to accomplish during this six hour outage? You knew it was coming, Packy. <laughs> we're, 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 what, were, were babies not able to get their formula? Were like banks not allowed? They did all the money to, like, I'm just curious what, you know, that six hour outage caused in real human normal life. Frankly, I mean, like, honestly, I don't think it costs, you know, even if important things are happening, that's a lot. I don't think that six hour outage does anything. Like people are not running critical infrastructure on top of it. Their goal is to become kind of the, the web three NASDAQ stock exchange, whatever, um, so, you know, that to the extent that that happens in a decade and then this happens, that's an, an issue for right now, 
what is your general, I guess, uh, we've, we've obviously had you on uh, a couple times in the past, but what, what is your general posture to crypto? I think that was, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe not the words that Zach used, but the intent of it. Like, uh, you're, you're an optimist by nature, and this is cool tech that's being built. What's your, like, maybe just level setting on the perspective of, uh, yeah, how you view the ecosystem? Well, I, I would actually ask even a more specific question. I'm not, I'm not trying to go at you, but an actual question, which is like, what is the use case for Solana that gets you excited the most? Not like developers love it type use case, but the specific, you know, top two or three. That's what I'm curious about. I mean, I think, you know, Solana so far has been uh, most successful in attracting DeFi projects. I don't think there's a DeFi project on any ecosystem right now. Like, it, it's not where I invest. It's not, you know, I don't think it's, Particularly, you know, there's a few uh, interesting use cases out there that are kind of touching the real world and aren't just kind of incestuous DeFi. But the promise of Solana, I think, if it if it gets big, is that more finance moves on chain and it moves on to Solana as opposed to one of the other networks because so it's fast, fast settlement times and and cheap transactions. And so, if you're excited about Solana, I think that's what you're excited about. For now, it, it's in the same state that a lot of crypto's in, which is people playing around and experimenting and in that case, like NFTs are cheaper, cheaper transaction costs. You can move more fluidly. I think the the transaction volume on things like Mag Magic Eden, uh, which is their NFT marketplace, are as high or higher than uh, OpenSea's just based on volume. Uh, so more people are able to get involved over there. So that's interesting. But I don't think I'm going to convince anybody that the crypto is the future just based on people trading NFTs right now. But to the extent that one DeFi becomes a thing, I think a lot of it happens on Solana, assuming they're able to fix these issues. Uh, and then two to the extent that a lot of these other use cases, NFTs as tickets or membership or all of that kind of stuff happen, they might happen on Solana because you don't want to be paying $100 gas fees in order to like buy a ticket to a movie or a sporting event or X, Y, or Z thing. Yeah. I mean, you could also go on Eventbrite and buy a ticket, but... What's Event? Is that Web2? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's weird. It has a business model. They charge fees. They make money. It's an odd thing. Though on the, it's like, so on the DeFi thing, I guess like what what... I mean, DeFi is kind of this generic term, right? For like trading stuff on crypto. It, it's, as you know, which one, like what use case do you feel like is, because I always get that answer. I get to like, well, DeFi. And then I'm like, okay, well, which DeFi use case? And to your point of like, there's a lot of incestuous stuff, right? It always starts with like, so imagine you own this coin and then like everything kind of flows down from there, which is like, all right, but like, look, like, can we just stop with the initial assumption of like, why do I own this coin in the first place? But you sent me something, you said something that's really interesting, which is like the, the transition into the real world stuff. Uh, and I've heard that a few times and then I never got like a satisfying answer on what that was. Yeah. So what there's one of those. I think there's, there's a bunch of different potential use cases. And this is why I hate doing the, the web three debate generally. Cause it's like the, everything sucks right now is like very, not everything, but like there's a lot of stuff that sucks right now is like a very clear, obvious stance. And then my stance has to be like, but like this is progress and in the future yeah. people will build crazy, crazy well, things. But here's, here's, here's what I'll push back on that one because just because it doesn't work perfectly right now doesn't mean you can't logically reason your way to why it should work or why it would be better. Like this whole thing of like Solana goes down, they'll fix it. Oh. I mean, even the stuff of like Bitcoin is slow, honestly, like someone will figure this out. Like the technical problems will be worked out. I, I've never been the person who's like, you know, crypto doesn't work because the technical issues are tough or it's like bad for the environment. It's all crap. Like it'll get worked out from a technical perspective. No question. Totally. More about like, okay, how do we reason through why, you know, this use case would be better as opposed to the technical issues? Those ones don't concern me. Yeah, yeah, no. So if we if we reason through why these things can be better, I mean, like, take for example, no one's done this yet. This is one of those like promised things, but the the real estate transaction that takes three months needs title needs all these things that take a long time. You could theoretically make all of these things NFTs. An NFT doesn't it doesn't mean there's going to be like a house with a picture of a monkey on it, but these things could all be NFTs, and you could transact very quickly. You could borrow against them in a global market as opposed to having to go to Bank of America to take out your mortgage. You have a more kind of open system that that people are able to, I think, transact in more creative ways in. That's so like, I put my house on the blockchain and then I can borrow against it. Yeah, you can put your house on the blockchain and borrow against it, which again, like here actually is, you know, like a lot of the use cases are like, well, imagine that you're in a place where, you know, inflation is super high. And so this is. Okay, but let's, let me just, let's just do that one. Cause that's my favorite one. 
uh, I put my house on the blockchain, which doesn't really mean anything because uh, you can't physically put it on the blockchain. Uh, and then somebody lends me whatever, 500,000 USDC or some stable coin. And then I take it and I buy some ridiculous NFT of Logan. It's probably worth 600,000 or something. Yeah, a lot. And then it goes to zero because they actually look at it. And <laughs> now you got to, you need the money, right? Because you, you lent me that $500,000. I'm just like working this through. Like you lent me the $500,000 because my, my digital house was on the blockchain. And then you say, okay, Zach, that Logan thing was pretty stupid. I need your house. This is the record of your house that I own. And then I say, no. What do you do? You show up to the sheriff's department. You like look at this like piece of cryptography that says I own this house. Like what? Like that's what I mean. Like what does that even mean? How do you get the house? I think there's a, two separate things here. What I think you're saying implies that like the law never touches crypto, and that there's like this whole separate universe. Same thing that would happen if you took out a mortgage and didn't pay would happen. You'd get repossessed. Right. Same thing would, would happen here. Because the bank owns like the title to the house and I've signed a bunch of legal documents showing that I've given them that and those legal documents are basically what you're saying is we're going to recreate the entire system and just have a public record of it. That's all. That's like to me, that's exactly what, wherever you walk these through ideas through, it always ends up with like, oh, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like right now you go to you go to a Bank of America or wherever else. In this case, you might tap into a, a you know, wider pool of, of borrowers who are lenders in this case, get a lower cost of capital, not negotiate with the same bank and be able. Why would I get a lower cost of capital from a random person versus a massive bank like Wells Fargo? Well, you wouldn't, I mean, it'd be from a pool of people. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Like, but I, I don't think it doesn't. I'm all for like the technology is cool, but like there's no, as you work the idea through, the minute you put an on real asset on chain, you realize, oh, right. Like the only reason I can borrow against these real assets is because there is a document that the U.S. court system will enforce. There's a document in this case too here, and there's no reason that the U.S. court system wouldn't enforce it. It's a smart contract as opposed to like a ream of papers or an online document. But then what makes it smart? The whole point of a smart contract is that the computer can do everything. And here, what you're saying is I've got to now take this contract to the U.S. court system. I have to prove that I own it. I need the sheriff to then show up and get me out. You've just recreated the entire mortgage infrastructure that already exists today. On the blockchain. <laughs> but that exactly. Right. It's, it's like, and then I'm, I'm lost as to like why the on the blockchain part matters besides basically what everyone means is they mean, oh, I want a public record of the transaction. Okay. Right. Like, sure. That's, that's the thing you're looking for. But ultimately every other step in the process is essentially the exact same thing you have to do in the real world. Had you heard a crypto example? I mean, you were talking to some smart, you know, co-founder of a major, uh, uh, crypto exchange today. Like as you've pressed on this, has there been any use case, uh, and to some extent, like the evangelism and enthusiasm of this is somewhat self-perpetuating in that, like maybe to the point technologically you were able to do these types of things from residual values with tickets, right? But this is unlocking more galvanization behind this, right? And starting to talk about it in a more meaningful way. Have you, in talking to smart people on crypto, have you heard a use case that like you, you've thought, and it's just a matter of market sizing or something that you just don't believe it's this big or has there not been a single other than digital gold, I guess, uh, which we've talked about, has there been anything that you've, you've heard that makes sense? I would, I would say there's three that I've seen where it's like, okay. And, and, and the, the anchor to the first is always digital gold. Like I yeah. think there's some truth in religion to that, right? Like people believe so it exists. And I think I buy that. Um, what is actually, I don't know this offhand, Packy. what's the market cap of Bitcoin right now? 600 billion. And what's the market cap of gold? It looks like 12 trillion. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a little less, but whatever. Let's just call it ten trillion or something. Let's call Bitcoin one trillion to keep it simple. Uh, so let's say over the course of like thir this is my negative on it. The course of thirty years, right? Like society has to change and people's belief in like Bitcoin over gold, right? So you want basically what your theory is like the gold asset class kind of comes down as a as a total market cap and Bitcoin kind of rises because they're interchangeable in terms of how people view them. So now what you've got is like this thirty year bull case. 
of Bitcoin going from a market cap of 800 billion or something to like, I don't know, maybe it evens out, you know, it's clearly not going to replace it. So like it evens out because there's a lot of stuff built on top of gold to like 5 trillion. And if you do the math on that, just as an investment vehicle, and by the way, that's the bull case, right? That is a 5X return over 30 years from where we are, which will give you an IRR of like, I don't know, red point, like 2%, what's your, what's your returns there? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I just, that anyway, I, I didn't mean to start with like, here's this good thing and then rip on it, but I didn't love, I don't love the like upside yeah, yeah, okay. case on- So on that's gold. one, what that's other two? And then, and then downstream of that is like, okay, theoretically you should be able to provide leverage, quick leverage on top of it, because now we at least have like some stable assets. Sure. So if I own it, by the way, you can get leverage on your gold today to be very clear. Like anybody who can buy gold, you don't buy the physical gold, by the way, you buy paper that represents the gold and you can lever it up. So that's just, it's a little complicated. And I agree it'll be easier to do it in Bitcoin, but it all starts with that like fundamental Bitcoin belief. Fine. Okay. Like I believe in digital gold religion, we'll have something in there. Two, money laundering and not the actual laundering of the money because crypto is actually probably one of the worst places to launder money. It's actually an amazing feature of like how easy it is to catch criminals, but the enterprise software company is catching the criminals. Chainalysis, TRM Labs, we're an investor in TRM. Those make a lot of sense, right? Like you need to give the authorities, whether it's the FBI or whomever else, tools to track this stuff, because it is complicated. And so in a funny way, like this, the ease of which you can catch criminals because you can kind of trace this, it's just kind of hard for authorities to do it, makes I think Chainalysis and TRM like really, really interesting businesses. And, and they pass my sniff test always of like, is this an interesting enterprise software company? And I think they are. I think those are really interesting enterprise software companies. The third one I've heard and like wires and money transfer on like nights and weekends. But here's the thing, like A, what percentage of the like actual money transfer do we need that to be, right? Like what what is the actual impact? I agree it's a gap, like, and it would be nice to be able to do, you know, weekend transfers too, like, you can actually transfer money within Venmo and PayPal and all these other places like pretty easily at any time. It just takes a little bit, you know, to clear. So like, you know, there's some value there. But if you do the math on it, it's like, well, what is the market cap of that problem? And it's like, I don't know, Western Union's market cap, like 20 billion, you know? It, my problem with it is like, that's the big third use case. And then all of a sudden you actually look at the math of like how much money can be made doing this. Because ultimately like you have to make money doing this stuff. Uh, and it looks like Western Union, basically. And those are the three that I think to me have stood out because I, I obviously don't believe in the NFT thing being, you know, a long-term stable opportunity. Uh, beyond that, nothing. Nothing has passed the SIF test. That I would, I would bet on. Nothing that I would like write a check into and be like, I believe this is going to be a profitable business in 15 years. Have you guys made any, any crypto investments at all? Is that, I assume that's for Zach. Yeah. We did TRM, uh, and I would have done chain analysis if I saw it early. Uh, I really love that idea. Uh, I was a personal investor in, in Lolly, uh, cause I thought it was like a clever way of getting people almost like a real world marketing hack onto like getting people into Bitcoin. I think it's really clever and it, and it is working, um, as well. Those are the two, there's like one or two, we've looked at a lot of stuff, um, but I haven't gotten there on like, is this a long-term sustainable business? Cause that's, we're looking at them. Our model at operator is to look at them as enterprise software companies. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, I got wrecked on the the mortgage example, cause I've never thought through that one before. I, again, I think DeFi is like not the most interesting place in the world. I think there's going to be a bunch of fun stuff that happens on the social side. I think there's going to be, uh, I, I'm, I'm a much bigger believer in NFTs, not necessarily as profile pictures, but as just a way to make digital things feel and behave more physically. And as we spend more time online, like I think there's going to be interesting things that people come up with. DeFi is just never where I've been particularly excited. I don't think TradFi is particularly exciting. Like loans, there's nothing exciting about bringing that on the blockchain has never, never made me particularly, uh, particularly excited. But I do think there's going to be a lot more on the kind of creative tools side and on the social network side and all of that kind of stuff. Not that it's going to be like Twitter with a coin, but that, having this shared database of like kind of all of the social interactions that people have online and letting anybody build on top of that, I think is going to produce a bunch of really interesting stuff that I'm not nearly smart enough to, to predict. So we will see, but it's yeah, never, never a fun argument to, to have. 
I mean, it would be great. Like I, I would be all for, you know, could you get like social networks to record some version of your data in like a more movable format? And I don't know whether that's crypto or not, but you know, that's going to require regulation, you know, to push it. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think the, the issue with, with so much of this is that you sit and you like push quite a bit on, or I push quite a bit on like, well, talk to me about like how this works. I don't need the theory, but like what, step one, step two, step three, and you end up in this thing of like, well, what if, and you know, no good businesses classically have been built on like, Hey, what if there's usually some reasonable way to like, think it through. Um, that's all I got. That's it. I don't know. I just, I'm still waiting. And, and I, I swear I, uh, when somebody pitches me an idea, that's fantastic. That like crypto crushes. I will say that is a fantastic idea and try and invest. And maybe I'll just wire them a bunch of money and forge a document. And like uh, That's design. honestly the move, man. That's the that's the way you get all this stuff done. Yeah, my guess, just in closing, my guess is that we don't get another bull cycle on hype and that if there is, and, and I think there will be, but I think that when there is an X bull cycle, it will be on the backs of use cases like that that become... Uh, that actually like attract consumers and get people paying money and all of that kind of stuff. Game five might be one of them. All the gamers hate it. Uh, so there's a bunch of like, I think irons in the fire and I don't think we get another bull market without real consumer adoption starting to happen. So we will see. I think that's right. Rates, rates are too high and, and are likely to stay high enough for people to have like alternative places to park their money. And, and this is not just crypto, by the way, obviously, right? This is like, you know, any good new company is going to have to show like this can work. Uh, I think the tide has has turned. So that that I agree with completely. Another thing that was interesting this week, Elon Musk's ultimatum to Tesla execs return to the office or get out. So uh, they leaked an email. Uh, it, initially, it was to just the executive staff, Elon's email basically saying, a minimum of 40 hours uh, are required for all executives. And uh, and then he went on to leak another email to, or, or another email was leaked that was sent to everyone, uh, making it very clear that 40 hours a week were requ required across the board from everyone. Um, and he said, he went on to say, there are, of course, companies that don't require this, but when was the last time they shipped great new products? It's been a while. Tesla has and will create and actually manufacture the most exciting and meaningful products of any company on earth. This will not happen happen by phoning it in. Uh, someone then commented uh, asking about people that uh, didn't want to be in the office, what they should do. Elon said <laughs> they should pretend to work somewhere else, which I, uh, as as only Elon is able to do on Twitter. Would you, Packy, would you think of, uh, of this as a work from home, by the way, is like a hot button issue in general that I always have people very mad at me, no matter what side you take on this. So I would tread lightly with what you're about to say, but what were your thoughts on Elon here? It's Elon. I don't know. I, I I actually think it makes a lot of sense for a lot of companies and particularly ones where there are a, a large portion of the company has to be on site. And so to have the people who can work remotely and the people who are actually there building the cars on site, I do think that presents some kind of unique challenges. So I actually don't think this is particularly crazy, but Elon's involved. And so it became the biggest story. But I don't know, I'm, I'm a I work from home because I work by myself, but uh I, I think probably the right answer is somewhere in between, which is hopefully not going to get me get me canceled, but it's Elon, so we're talking about it. I mean, look, companies get a brand, right? Like a reputation and a brand, and you reach a certain status where you can demand things that are out of market or just different. Uh, and whether that's Tesla or Apple or I guess historically like of Google or Facebook, maybe, you know, a few years ago, people value that brand on their resume. And so they can in a sense, do what they want to do because, you know, the brand overcomes maybe the employee backlash for that one particular item. And Tesla's clearly in that category. So it makes sense. I agree, by the way, like that plus the combination of they have plenty of factory employees and it's, you don't want that like haves and have nots type of uh, structure. And I think for them, actually, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, I actually, uh, uh, I, I do agree with you guys. I, I, Elon obviously said it in a more dickish way than uh, maybe needed to be communicated, but I uh, they're, they're manufacturing a physical product here. And also I think it's, 
I think it's a good thing that there is optionality in the style of uh, work that people have, right? And we, we've talked about this in the past, but like, would I want to work in the Brian Armstrong, Coinbase, no social issue environment? No, I, I, I wouldn't want to do that. But like, is it good that there's a place that is presenting employees this option? You know, it, it's not, everyone doesn't get a vote with these things, right? And like CEOs and leaders of these companies get to decide what makes the most sense for their culture. And so I, now I think it was hilarious how Elon worded it and probably uh, unnecessarily um, vitriolic or whatever, but it's his prerogative, right? He can do whatever he wants. And if he thinks this works best for the products they're making, then uh, I, I, more power to him. Should we just do Eli? I've been an Elon defender for a while, I think, in the beginning of the Twitter thing and, and just kind of overall, I think he's done a, a whole hell of a lot of good. I know that you've had people on here, Logan, who who uh, disagree with a lot of the things he's done. And he's kind of annoying the hell out of me now. I, I, I'm a little bit over uh, Elon. I know I'm going to get nerds in the comments flying in front of the bullets right now, but it's uh, clearly something has gotten to his head over the past couple of months. And the the whole routine is getting a little bit tired. Is it Elon or is it the coverage of Elon, right? Like how much of this is, you know, media's obsession with him versus like stylistically how he's approaching this stuff? I think it's both, frankly. Like, you know, when he's replying to random anons with like five followers whenever they agree with him, like it's just a weird thing for the richest person in the world to be doing. And I know that's part of his charm and the fact that he's on Twitter mixing it up with people is great, but like it seems like pretty insecure. He won. That's what happened. Yeah. Like he won, you know, like there was a, years of people saying Tesla will never make a, a buck. The cars don't really work. They have manufacturing defects. They can never produce them. The company's going to be worth shit, whatever. There were like so many things. And so he always had an enemy, you know, a good enemy is great. I mean, I have plenty that like motivate me every day because I just despise them. And I have them like pictures of them in my head. And, you know, I think Elon had like a whole book and then eventually mostly the shorts. And he kind of won, you know, like Tesla's doing well. Is it worth whatever they're worth right now? Like, who knows? But like, that is going to be a long-term sustainable company, clearly. Uh, and so I think he's kind of moved on from that. And now he needs like a new enemy or a new thing. And this is this is it. It's like the public, if you will, or politics. I don't know exactly what he's picking, but it's clearly he feels like I've won this battle. I need something new. I think that's right. I was a Tesla long, super early, and then I sold early because I'm an idiot. But I remember even back then, and like this was like 2012, 2013, the shorts absolutely hated Elon. He's proven them wrong there. SpaceX, like I could not be more impressed by. Like I think what he's doing is really, really impressive. It's just, and it's not like on me to judge. This is like a shut up and dribble kind of thing. But like you want your kind of superhero to just like not be a normal human being, kind of. And he's doing all these cool things, and then kind of just muddying it all with with this. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's funny is I actually saw this week, the New York Times ran a story that uh, there is a, a billionaire um, that is running as a single issue candidate for Senate in California. And his single issue is uh, Tesla's misrepresentation of their self-driving software. And that's like all <laughs> these that's all he's running on. And I, I don't know how he's polling, but he's like put three and a half million dollars already of his own money into the campaign with that as a single issue. And so I will say like, I don't know. I, I I like this level of relatability uh, and humor that comes along with all of it. Now, part of the problem is I voluntarily put myself behind a microphone and talked about things uh, on a weekly basis going on in tech. And and a third of that uh, seems to have been Elon related. And so I certainly am uh, exhausted by all of it. But it is it's good sport. And honestly, this is filling a void that uh, the president of the United States used to fill to some extent. And I'd much rather it be this guy who's launching rockets into space and doing satellite internet and, you know, building these cool cars and tunnels. And I would much prefer it be that than, you know, someone with their their fingers on the nuclear codes or whatever. Um, so I guess from that, like palace intrigue kind of like whatever uh insanity on a regular basis i guess i it's beneficial but he enjoys the the fight like at the end of the day that's it he likes the fight it motivates him it gets him out of bed he knows he can win because he's like you know clever and creative and now has tons of resources and it's like it doesn't matter if it's that five person anonymous troll on twitter or like the senator in, L in california or whatever he just likes to fight it's great it's it's i agree it's super entertaining i'm glad it's him and not our president it's nice amen
I, uh, you know, I was talking, I mean, I do think ultimately he's going to be faced with the uh, decision. I, I talked to Matt Levine, uh, uh, which people will hear on the back side of this episode. And uh, Matt's, Matt kind of, he said, like, I don't really see how he's getting out of this buying Twitter thing, right? I, I think, uh, I mean, may, I'm sure where there's a will, there's a way, but uh, I think that will be super interesting. I've been sitting here in disbelief the entire time. And if he actually ends up with Twitter as a platform that he's controlling, which like I just I, I just haven't thought was actually going to happen. But um, that rhetoric and intrigue and all this stuff is going to be ramped up to uh, to like even a level beyond what we've seen today. And so, yeah, it'll be it's certainly it, interesting. Isn't it amazing? Like he started out buying Twitter and everyone's like, we can't let him buy Twitter. And then he kind of like tries to back out of it. And now everyone's like, you must buy Twitter. <laughs> and he's like really turned the conversation. I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but now the like rhetoric is you can't let him back out of this deal. I thought we were supposed to be angry that he was doing it. And now we're angry that he's not doing it. And he's it's like, what am I supposed to believe here? And the press doesn't actually give a shit. They just want something to write about. And it's fun. You know, it's I think it'd watch. be really funny. I was thinking about this. Like if, because now Twitter's like, you have to buy us, right? And if Elon was like, no, I don't want to buy you now, like, would <laughs> would they force them into a lawsuit, like, and make a judge rule that, like, hey, you have to take this company from us, right? And, like, 3,000 or whatever, 5,000, I don't know how many employees work at Twitter, but, like, thousands of people's jobs at stake. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want it. And they're like, no, 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 you have to take it. You agreed. You will take this, Right. And so that's the one way I think he could get out of it is like, would it really be a good look if someone be like for the board to be like, no, give backs uh, with 5000 people's jobs, uh, uh, you know? Well, to Elon's own point, you know, you can probably run Twitter with half the people and a third of the time and it would still do perfectly fine. So does it actually kill Twitter? Probably not. But that's just the thing is just unstoppable. Like maybe it won't make a ton of money, but it's just it's like a. Uh, it's like cocaine of the internet, you know, like you just can't give it up and you're stuck and there's no alternative. I like that. That, 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 that might be the headline of the episode, cocaine of the internet, Twitter. Yeah, I know. I like that. Uh, this is not the most notable news of the week uh, in terms of actual impact on society or anything like that, but definitely the most entertaining. So uh, I guess I came across this this week on Twitter, but a VC firm threatened a media war <laughs> against a startup after an unsolicited investment. So uh, one of UK's leading Amazon ag aggregators called Heroes uh, settled a lawsuit with the VC firm Solid Capital after alleging the investor fabricated a document to say that they had invested in the seed round. Uh, Heroes claimed when confronted about the documents, Solid made inappropriate threats to both the company and its investors. Um, Heroes was launched in 2020. It was buying up smaller Amazon sellers and growing their brand, had raised $265 million to date, a mixture of debt and equity. Um, what happened was when Heroes went out to raise their seed round in May 2020, Solid Capital was one of the VC firms that Hero approached about investments. Uh, the round was oversubscribed and Solid Capital was not accepted as part of the investment. After Heroes told Solid they weren't going to be included in the round, Solid sent two unsolicited sums of money to Heroes' bank account, one for uh, 800,000 pounds and one for a million pounds, which Heroes says they returned to the venture capitalist. Uh, the, the venture capital firm proceeded to make a series of wrongful allegations and threats against the startup and produce two crudely fabricated versions of the agreement purporting to show heroes as having signed the document. Uh, so I had never heard of anything like this. This is kind of the peak of uh, VC over eagerness. Zach, before we were talking, you, you said that you actually, this company actually pitched you. Yeah, I met them. I met them early on when they were raising, I think the initial or maybe the second equity round for, for heroes. They're, they're, they're good. They're really sharp. I mean, I kind of understand why someone would just send them a bunch of money. Uh, they're, they was an impressive, impressive team. I don't know how they would get the wire information. That's the one thing. Like, I, I believe this whole story. I'm 100% on the company side of this because, like, why, you know, it seems like only one side of this really has a dog in the fight to, uh, to make this situation manifest itself. But I just don't understand how they had the bank routing information to send the money to them. I, I want to see the document. I just like the whole, I'm reading this whole thing and all I'm thinking is like, 
did they scribble it in the page? Was it like a digital DocuSign state? Like, how did they forge this? Yeah, we promise we will let solid capital invest in this round. It has to be pretty unprompt, like unprecedented in terms of like, I, I just, I mean, this seems like one of the more ridiculous situations for a startup to find themselves in, like risking threats from a VC firm claiming that you invested. I, I just, I don't even understand what, who you turn to in this situation. I guess, I mean, ultimately it went to the courts, but it would seem that VC is like enough reputation based in all this that like, sending money and threatening a startup wasn't going to work out really well for this firm. The weird thing is I, I read the whole article, but there was no background on the actual firm that did it, right? Like who the partners were, who the investors are, which that's most, that's the most interesting thing. Like who are the crazy people behind this? Right? Like what's, do you know? It says solid capital. Yeah. I, I actually don't know anything about solid capital. I, I they said, I saw at one point they're like a Netherlands based, uh, I think they're, they're based in the Netherlands and maybe have an office in Brazil as well. When I went to their website, uh, it hadn't been updated since 2018, uh, or at least the like copyright on the bottom is. So I I'm not sure this is the most like, you know, uh, forward thinking group. Although I, I don't know, they, they invented a new way of financing. So maybe they are. Oh, we found so them. Robert Willem. I don't, I'm on their website, solidcapitalpartners.com. Is that them? Yeah, it seems like it. Well, we've got, you know, the website's still up and this photo is still there, which probably goes to show their attention to detail is consistently lacking because that would be the first thing I take down immediately, like get my information off the website. And like, I don't want anyone to know who I am. I'm looking them up on PitchBook. There is, there's nothing about them on PitchBook unless they're Solidus Capital from Columbia, which I think is actually the other place that they had an office and maybe they're Solidus Capital, but not much there. If so, they're from Cali. The wire info thing is really interesting because like you normally don't give the firm your wire info until the end. Yeah. So how did they know where to wire the money? What was the document that was fabric? I, I, I would love to hear more about this. And honestly, like just some of the gross little details would be fascinating. Well, this feels like that, that like Turner Novak style Twitter joke where he's like, all right, I wired the money. Like, blah, blah, blah. like this joke has been made a million times. I didn't know that people actually did this. You make the joke enough and someone wills it into, into existence. I, uh, yeah, I mean, Turner really was the, the pioneer of this as a concept. Turns out it's, it's Logan's 2022 deal flow strategy, actually. <laughs> That's right. No, this is 2021. Now, now we're doing diligence and asking questions and stuff. 2022, uh, yeah, 2022 versus 2021 is the difference here. What are the, the diligence questions? We're on Logan's deal flow generator right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know the questions. It's what is your wire information and can you send me a copy of the term sheet? That's right. Who is leading? Uh, that, that's all I really ask. Do you guys have uh, Sheryl Sandberg stepping down in you? The New York Times, I think, said this was like the end of women leadership in tech or something. They've been on, on a roll recently. The end of girl boss. I, uh, Zach, do you have anything there? I just feel like it's, it's like pretty demeaning. To, to me, if I were Sheryl Sandberg, to be like my one redeeming quality is that like I'm a woman boss, like she's an exceptional executive and why are all the articles about her being female? Like, why is that relevant in a sense? Like, I think it's just, she's an incredible executive and it's like a, a more interesting story about, you know, how much she's done at Facebook, whether you think it's a good company or not. It's hard. It's hard to be like a strong female founder executive because it's it's like the second thing the press wants to talk about is not like the work you did or your accomplishments it's your gender and it's to me it would be if i were in that you know position and i obviously am not like that would be frustrating to me you know if everyone's first article was like hey zach weinberg jewish guy did this thing i'd be like why what does that have to do with the thing i did uh it that would frustrate me and I would guess it frustrates her. So I agree a hundred percent with that. One of the funny parts in her, uh, in her post was that she said, I had tried the Facebook as it was first called, but still thought the internet was a largely anonymous place to search for funny pictures. And <laughs> her prior job was VP of global online sales and operations at Google. So like it was a funny framing and like kind of revisionist history. It makes for a good narrative of all of it. Um, yeah, it's uh, the revisionist history, by the way. I love that. I, I think there is a if you can go down like every major startup and you look at the story they tell and then you like compare and contrast it to the actual story of like how it got started. 
98% of them are totally revisionist history. And I think the one that isn't is actually probably Tesla because he, from day one was like, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And then he went and did it. And then, you know, now you have like Zuckerberg talking about how he wanted to connect the world and like, he wanted to look at pictures of girls. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was hot or not, hot or not modernized. You know, it was interesting. I think, uh, I mean, obviously the New York Times is, it has done themselves no favors with their headlines here, but uh, it, Sandberg in, in general has had like a interesting, I mean, an amazing run as an operator, like since she's been there. Right. Uh, and the company, uh, I think grew from 500 to 78,000 employees and a hundred million to 3 billion active users, like under her leadership, which is just like insane. Right. And when she joined Zuckerberg was a 23 year old. I just imagine like she was, I think 38 at the time coming in and like, I mean, you you hear all the stories about how big of a dick he was like back in uh, back in the early days. Like she deserves so much credit for the maturation of this company and the leadership she had and all of that. That said, it, it, the last couple of years have been like a little weird, right? Uh, in terms of she was definitely uh, her role uh, was uh, not clear. It wasn't growing to the same extent like other people's roles were. I think the Wall Street Journal ran something just showing how much uh, Javier and and uh, it, it, Javier's role had grown as a percentage of like headcount within the org. And then there was all the stuff about, you know, I think she really fell on the sword with uh, a lot of the Cambridge Analytica stuff. And, uh, you know, there's been reports, there was a book, An Ugly Truth, uh, inside ba Facebook's Battle for Domination that came out last year. And it like highlighted the strain between her and Zuckerberg as a result of Cambridge Analytica. And then there was all that Bobby Kodig stuff that the Wall Street Journal also reported on who she was dating at the time. And like she tried to use or the impl the implicit part was she tried to use her position as COO of Facebook to suppress uh, that Kodik had a temporary restraining order against him. And so it's just like an interesting I feel like her legacy uh, here, even regardless of Facebook, what you view of the business. Right. I. I um it's interesting that, you know, she stayed there far longer than I would have I would have guessed. Uh, and she probably had to deal with just who knows an endless amount of bullshit there. Right. But the last couple of years, I think it probably been pretty weird. It's a tough job. It really is. It's really hard to be, you know, what was she ever employee number a few hundred to like, they would have 100, 200,000 employees and. You know, it's at a certain point, the the thing is bigger than you, right? There's like only so much that, you know, one human being can really accomplish unless they are the dictator, right? Unless they're Zuckerberg. And so I always describe in some sense, like a little bit of this stuff is like, you're trying at, at that scale, unless you can de declare this is, you know, something we're going to do. You're, you're kind of trying to like steer a cruise ship with your hands. And at a certain point, that is just hard and annoying and impossible. I, I agree with you. I'm amazed she, she stayed on for this long that, you know, she made it this far. So I would have left if I were her, she had made totally in the world. She, she could have run for, you know, governor and maybe still will. Uh, I think maybe she, she stayed like a few more years than she needed. Yeah, I agree. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, I just, I don't know. We haven't talked about this here, but the company really leaves i think fortune had an interesting article this uh yesterday or today or something about i mean the company really is at such a crossroads right now as she like walks away uh and she she you know i mean they've grown to a tremendous amount of equity value and under her leadership right and they built just this monster of a company but like the whole meta thing, they were talking about the uncertainty. She was kind of like a security blanket for, I think, a lot of the employees internally and just like a steady hand. And now, gosh, I mean, you're you're facing antitrust everywhere you you look. You can't acquire your way out of anything. You're you're uh, constrained in your ability to ship product and you're betting the future of the company on this metaverse thing. It just feels like I don't know. I. I I am not, I, I was always such a bull on Facebook. And at this point, I just, uh, gosh, it feels like there's a, that could be in for a slow decline here. I'm excited to hear the story when it comes out about why she really left and why she left now, why she's been, why she stayed for the past few years. I wonder if there was a like, look, we're going through a bunch of shit. You got, you have to stay. But I wonder what pushed her over the edge right now. The job just starts to suck. The job sucked for, I mean, and I'm, to, to Logan's point, 
if you remember watching like old Zuckerberg videos, he was like a 12 year old running this, this company, like even after they had IPO'd and I think she helped mature him and helped mature the company and, and all of that. But there's probably not been very many times in the past decade where this has been a fun job. Well, I think of it as like, you can create a story in your head of like why you're there. And I think it, you were Facebook, it was, you're building this like massive machine that continues to grow and make an impact in whatever way you describe that. And I think that was true. Now, maybe the day-to-day problems are annoying, but you, you can create a purpose, right? Yep. For yourself of like why you're doing it. And then all of a sudden when that tops out and the kind of macro goal you've had in your head for the last 15 years or so is no longer the goal and you have to like reinvent it because it's no longer like this massive growth machine. I mean, it still makes a ton of money and it's a very profitable business, but now they're trying to like turn the ship. They have competition coming from TikTok and the core Facebook app is hurting. It's a totally new, you know, sense of motivation. And I think you really have to like rebuy into the vision if you want to do this. What if she's a billionaire? Like, why does she have to have that job? Yeah. Uh, and maybe she just doesn't buy the metaverse thing. Yeah. Well, I agree to Packy's. I mean, I, I think the last whatever, 18 months or something, there was probably some point that uh, uh, may, maybe she just wanted to stay this whole time, right? And maybe that was the answer. But I do. I get the feeling there's like more, there'll, there'll be some books written about like the last five years and her basically Cambridge Analytica on and her relationship with Zuck and, you know, all the stuff that kind of went on between uh, the leadership of Facebook and kind of how they got to the place that they are. I know, I mean, a lot of the reporting has said that Zuckerberg really blamed her for the PR fallout uh, around Cambridge Analytica. And so- I'm- I, I bet you she was planning on leaving and then and then COVID hit. Yeah. And like, you can't leave your people that you've, you know, been in charge of and motivated and said, you know, really kind of, you put yourself out there and then in the middle of like a crisis where the company is going through, like, how do we work and everyone's at home and all that. I don't think she could have left during that mentally. And I, and I agree with that. And so my guess is this is just like, okay, it feels like COVID is over. Now's the time. And a number of jokes that she's joining Andreessen Horowitz. I, uh, I, I, I happen to think that I think it's going to be political office or, uh, or, or nothing for, I mean, she certainly has thick enough skin to be a politician at this point, given all the spitballs she's, you know, had to deal with over the years. So yeah, I laughed at every one of those jokes, by the way, every yeah, time I great. saw it, I laughed. They were great. Well, honestly, really it, they were funny. it works. It's like a recurring, it, it's a trope, honestly, that works like anytime someone leaves a role and it always plays, it always plays well on Twitter. If you just say X person is excited to join Andreessen and Horowitz, like that's a guaranteed couple hundred likes if you're the first one to do it. Yeah. It's never yet old. Thank you to uh, Packy and Zach for joining. Um, So what you're about to hear next is a conversation I had earlier this week with Matt Levine from Bloomberg. Matt is one of my uh, favorite people to read uh, about financial news, about the markets, about all the crypto, all the different machinations. So it was a fun conversation. Matt, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Harassing you on Twitter for the last couple of weeks to, to come on and talk Elon. People, uh, people want me to come on their show when Elon does a lot of stuff, but that's when I have to write a lot of I, stuff. I believe that. Thankfully, uh, we've we've got a fairly quiet Elon week, so I appreciate you doing this. It's a little eerie. Yeah. I'm not yeah. writing tomorrow, so something's going to happen. It's ominous. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, maybe for folks that don't know, uh, you have written a newsletter at Bloomberg for how long now? 12 years? I've been at Bloomberg for about eight years, and the newsletter probably didn't start right away, but I don't know, six, seven years. Plus or minus. And you took a very uh, normal path to doing that. You were valedictorian of Harvard. Not exactly. Very high at your class at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, Then you taught Latin for a year. I did. Then you went to Yale Law School. Yep. Then you went to Wachtell. Yeah. And then you went to Goldman. Yeah. Very normal path into having a newsletter, writing, journalist, all that stuff. It's a very normal path in the sense that like, if you get a classics degree, you go to law school because there's nothing else to do. And if you go to law school and you do well, you go to Wachtel because it's like the number one firm in the prestige rankings. And if you're a M&A lawyer in like 2007, you're like, ah, oh, I should be in finance. And then Goldman is a sort of natural, like, you know, it's like very obvious, like prestige career moves. And you took that, the path of like, uh, like 
just the next logical it's step along the way. It's kind of the default, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I joke that I didn't make a uh, decision for myself until I was like 24 years old. I just sort of followed a path ahead of me that other people had done that seemed successful. Oh yeah, I mean that's yeah. I was I was just thinking that I I, um, I gave a talk at, at actually Yale Law School and they asked about my career decisions and I was like I only actually made one career decision. Right? Yeah, like I sort of did the normal thing and then one day at Goldman I was like I'm going to go be a financial blogger and that was a strange decision. But everything else was pretty straightforward. How old were you at the time? <sighs> the early thirties. Early thirties, and you just were you were you what was the thought process then that you were going to go be a, uh, a blogger? Well, I didn't want to do it anymore. And so didn't want to do Goldman. Yeah. I had like vaguely imagined being a writer. And, you know, I was like a person who had an office job and I sat at a desk reading like fun internet writing of the like, you know, two thousands. And so I sort of thought, This looks like fun internet writing. So yeah. I, I was like This is like Gawker. Yeah, like, Gawker and, and like Deal Breaker. Deal Breaker. Which was, you know, like yeah. the sort of early Deal Breaker was was fabulous. Um and uh but certainly like Gawker and the Gawker, you know, offshoots. Um, and I was like, that looks really fun. And I had vaguely imagined being a writer, but I had no idea what that meant. You know, I like thought of myself as one day being a writer, but like, I didn't like, I wasn't like writing a novel at night. And, uh, I also really didn't like being an investment banker anymore. And I didn't have a lot of responsibilities and I was saving a lot of money. And I was like, I'm going to stop doing this and spend like a year finding myself. And I actually tried to do that. I like went to my boss and I was like, I'm going to quit. He's like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know, find what, figure out what I'm going to do. And he's like, don't quit now. Like, go take a leave of absence. And so I went back to my desk and like, he was like, just work a few more weeks and then you can take a leave of absence. And then like Deal Raker was hiring and I was like, oh, I should do that. And so I, I, uh, a combination of not wanting to be a banker anymore and like the vaguest of dreams about being a writer, I, I left for Deal Raker. The, co- the confluence of those two things. I, we're, where were you in your personal life at that point? Did you have, you didn't have kids. Did you have a wife? Uh, I was living with the woman who's now my wife. Yeah. We did not have kids. Was she, a dog. was she saying like, or you're out of your mind or was she um, supportive? Like what was the, the support group around you? Parents or, or siblings or wife, uh, soon to be wife. What was the reaction that I'm going to go be a blogger? Uh, you know, like it was kind of clear that I was not happy banking and also not like really cut out for it. And so she did want me to like figure something out. I think that like her rational, uh suggestion was why don't you try like blogging on the side to see if you're any good at it before you quit your job to do it full time when you've never done it and i was like yeah that makes sense but i just i'm tired when i come home and so i'm just gonna do it and see what happens um i think she was skeptical but she didn't she was supportive and, yeah uh, yeah and so you were at deal breaker for f- like two years two years mm-hmm. and and what was Take me through like what you st- set out to go do originally. You know, I had no idea, right? Like I sort of liked internet writing and sort of vaguely, you know, I didn't really know what journalism was like. And like, you know, sort of early two th- like 2000s blogs like conflated these things, but there's like, you know, there's like breaking news and going out and getting sources and sure. getting scoops and stuff like that. And then there's like typing your thoughts in a box, right? And Clearly now my career is like typing my thoughts in a box and I try not to break news. But like, I didn't know, I didn't like really have a clear sense of that distinction in my mind and, and deal breaker did not like enforce that distinction. So I was like, I'm going to go be like a swashbuckling journalist and also like make really good jokes. And, you know, deal breaker at the time was, was, run, was like essentially a solo project of best Levin, who's this like genius writer of the like, comedy. And so I was like, I'll write jokes like Bess. And, you know, like I sort of didn't know what I was going to do, but I sort of, there were models on the internet of what writing looked like. And then I did it. And over time sort of like figured out what I was actually good at. And how, how long did it take you to land on the voice that we, we know today uh, that comes out in the Bloomberg writing? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I want to say that like by like six months or so after starting at deal breaker, I was writing like myself and like early on, I was not. I was like very yeah, much yeah, putting on a trying post. to be someone else. Um, it felt more natural after about six months. But I think that the sort of the voice has evolved over time, and and uh, I, even like you know now I go back like five years, and you know I've been doing this in some form for like eleven years now. I go back like five years, and I'm like oh, this is like very different. Like, it doesn't sound like me. So. Yeah. so you did that, and did you have a newsletter at the time that you were uh, publishing to, or is it just going on the website? It was just going on the website. Dealbreaker was like a real blog. Um, like 
in a way that is like been rendered more difficult by sort of social media and people's changing media consumption habits. Like I think of like the email newsletter as being kind of the successor to sort of classic blogging and that like it's it's like associated with with a person's voice and it has mul- multiple top multiple like items yeah, in sure. a day and you like go visit it every day. In my case it comes to your email but like you know old school deal worker like you go to the website every day and I think that's harder to do on a web-based blog now and now it's like the newsletter is like the way to get that relationship. The evolution of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and so why do you think, uh, so I assume if, if six months in you started to feel like your, yourself started to, yeah. started to feel like at least some version of the product we have today, what were you just following your own interests of like what you found interesting or yeah. how were you picking what the right, right about? I mean, part, it's mostly that, but it's also like just sort of, you know, uh, a sense of like, particularly now with the newsletter, like it goes out every day. And so like, you have to write something every day and you know the format is you have to write multiple things every day for the most part and so there's just like a sort of like just necessity component too yeah <laughs> like you sort of write about the big news that's in finance um but no most it's mostly it's just sort of what is interesting to me and it's like part of like the like finding my voice aspect is like you type what is interesting to you and you hope people read it and then like if you do that enough times and enough people read it, you're like, oh, like what is interesting to me like resonates with people, and so it's okay for me to pursue my interests. I always, I always like, even now, like I'm surprised by the extent to which, like, when I write something really, like, you know, I was a when I was at Goldman, I was an equity derivatives banker, and like I did these like very niche like corporate equity derivatives trades that like, like no one like there's no like media about them, no one yeah, writes yeah. about them, they're not interesting, but like. Every so often, you know, like Tesla got in a fight with JP Morgan over one of these trades and I was like, well, this is what I did for a living. I got to write about this in a sort of like, you know, in the weeds kind of way. And people love that stuff. Like it's always like, it's always surprising to me that people are interested in like the more arcane, like weird niche interests of mine, as well as like me writing about, you know, Elon buying Twitter. The internet's uh, remarkable in that regard, like the ability to have things that are seemingly niche. I mean, for better and for worse, right? But uh, if you have niche interests, it turns out a lot of people have niche interests as well that'll follow along with that. Yeah, I think there's like a, um, in like mainstream financial journalism, there's a sort of like bias that people are not interested in like technicalities and the weeds and like complicated products and like just the mechanics of things and like, uh, I feel like that bias is wrong and it's like, it's a nice opportunity for me because I get to write about those things in a place with relatively little competition. Yeah. It, it seems like your tone is, is kind of general amusement with all the machinations. Like it's, sure. it's not really the same cynicism that comes across. And I think that's what resonates with finance people or legal people or whoever it is that I don't know the b- majority of your followers but is yeah, that I don't know either by, by the way but like it's a lot of tech people and I think of I think of a lot of tech people as having the same like like it's people who like like structures and mechanics and like complication like for as a, as a sort of like intellectual puzzle and like as like an aesthetic appreciation and so yeah it's like like I was a derivative structure and I wasn't like you know, an evil person trying to put one over on my clients. And I also wasn't like, oh, this is evil, you know? And I wasn't like, oh, this is good. This is yeah. like saving the world. I was like, this is interesting. You yeah. know? Like, it's just like, you know, you're doing complicated, interesting structures and trying to solve puzzles. And that was appealing to me. And it felt appealing to a lot of people that I worked with and just in the financial industry generally. Like, you just like, you know, across the industry, you see a lot of people who like, it's clear that their interest is in like solving puzzles and that sort of like amused, like intellectual interest in things is, uh, I don't know, it's like underrepresented in like, you know, media about finance. And so it's like something that I can do. Was being a lawyer or uh, working on derivatives uh, at an investment bank, like I I feel like you do a really good job of um, distilling down seemingly complex things to layman's terms. I remember going back and reading your, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Luna Terra oh, thing yeah. and uh one of your bullet points in the whole thing was like if you can convince anyone that this is worth anything then you're in business yeah. right and it was explaining this very niche stable coin concept in a way that made a lot of sense was that was that something that came naturally to you growing up was it something that you refined at uh as a banker or a lawyer in terms of being able to explain these things in kind of a simple way yeah i mean i think it is 
something that you learn in those jobs where you're like a specialist. But like particularly like when I was a derivatives banker, like you're building like sort of complicated, you know, like you're talking to like the quants who are like building the, the models for your like things. And they're like talking about like, you know, option Greeks and like look back features and things. And then like you leave that room and you go talk to the client who's like, you know, like reasonably financially sophisticated. It's like a CFO of a company, but it's not someone who's interested in derivatives, right? Or who cares about option Greeks. And you're trying to tell them a story that is, uh, that is like, that like has some like economic, like intuition to it. And that is just like appealing in a sort of straightforward, simple way. Um, and so that sort of thing of like translating the like weird mechanics of the product into something that you can tell someone that is like a compelling story was quite hard for me at the time. Like, cause I just like yeah. going and pitching it to clients, but like it turned out to be a good practice for what I do now. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I struggle at times with, um, the altitude at which to talk about things. Right. So I'll spend time talking about different venture things and all people will tell me, Oh, you're, why explain that? Everyone knows that. And I'm like, yeah. well, no, a lot of people don't actually know that. And so it's kind of depends on who the audience is. Um, yeah. I mean, I definitely find like, as I, as, as I, as time goes by, I get more interested in explaining things at a, like a higher level of generality, um, where it's less like, this is how like this clause of the contract works. I'm like more like, this is the broad economic intuition for it. And it's like, you mentioned Luna, like, like I write too much about crypto and like people get mad because they're like right about, you know, real stuff. But I do love crypto because it's like, it, it's this like lab for like financial intuitions, you know, where like, uh, like, like what, like what is Luna reinventing, right? Like something, like yeah. it's not like, it's not like a concept that came from outer space. Like it's, it's like putting together pieces of previous financial innovations and then like throwing it on the blockchain. And if you can like describe the economic intuitions of it, it's like, um, First of all, you know not to invest in it. But secondly, like uh, it's just like I don't know. It's like it's 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 interesting to ex for explaining concepts. Like yeah. a lot of crypto, like I'm not that interested in like who's getting rich on it. But like as a way to like understand the sort of deeper financial concepts, like crypto is is like so often great for that. Well, it's like we're going through uh, one of my buddies' jokes that it, it's like we have a bunch of engineers learning financial regulations for the first time, yeah. like over the course of, you know, all this stuff that happened in the 20s, 30s, 40s or yeah. whatever. We're sort yeah. of going through it in the wild west right now of crypto. Um, I, I want to I go there in a second, but so so you were at Deal Breaker and then went over to Bloomberg. What was that? What was the thought process uh, at that point? Uh, you know, Bloomberg has a bigger platform and I've a heard bigger, bigger budget. And yeah. Uh, yeah, you've heard of it. Like, yeah. it's nice to, like, I don't call people a lot to be like, hi, I'm a reporter, you know, but like I do occasionally email people to be like, hey, I read for Bloomberg. And, and it's, it's a lot more helpful to say that than to say I read for Deal Breaker. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like, you know, the, the terminal readership, the, the readers of the Bloomberg terminal are good, right? Like you have a, a good audience, like you have a lot of, smart people yeah who, captive that are in the I hope they're not captive well yeah like they're, yeah they're, they're like, there you're, like you're sort they're of there you have the distribution. Out to smart readers yeah. yeah um did you did you ever think through different monetization models like once you came over did you say hey i i want this to be free and broad in distribution or did you think through doing a subscription paid newsletter at some point i mean conditional on bloomberg writing me a paycheck i want as much distribution, distribution as, as possible. broad as possible yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would rather, you know, right now it's free on the, on the, the, the email newsletter is free. And then like the web version is like part of the general Bloomberg paywall. Yeah. And if they came to me in tomorrow and said, we'd like to take it out from behind the paywall, I'd be like, great, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, but if they cut my salary, I wouldn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything has a price, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what's your, uh, so, so what's your writing process? I mean, you're pretty prolific in your ability to put out, uh, stuff. How do you, how do you go through, you know, determining this? Uh, there's not really a process. Like I wake up and panic and just try to sort of type. Um, it's, 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 it's very sort of underorganized. Like in my perfect world, I would, you know, write from five in the morning until, you know, 11 and then publish the thing at noon. And then in the afternoon sort of get ready for the following day's newsletter. But in practice, all of those things slip a lot. You know, part of it is just like my process is now increasingly like, hanging out with my kids in the morning. So it's like everything slips later in the day and gets harder to uh, prepare for the following day. But it's it's very much panic-based. You know, I sort of like read the web, 
flag some things that I want to write about and then like kind of figure out what I'm going to say mostly by writing and occasionally by walking around the house or whatever. How do you, how do you determine what's, what's actually interesting? I assume you've gotten pretty good feedback loops over the, the years of readers responding to things. And how, how do you think about like what to, what to go into? I mean, it's, it's mostly just literally what I find aesthetically interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's also, it's very much things where I feel like I have, uh, some sort of distinctive value add where like, I don't want to, I feel like a lot of people are really good about writing about the fed and I, I have no special knowledge of the fed. And so I'm just not going to write about the fed. Right. Um, but like, if there's some, if there's some weird niche element of like crypto or, of, you know, equity derivatives or whatever that people aren't writing about, or like, you know, like I write a lot about Elon's takeover of Twitter. I was an M&A lawyer for a little while. Yeah. Right? And there are not a lot of M&A lawyers like writing on the web about Elon's sort of thing. And there are a lot of people writing like wrong things about, you know, whether he can get out of the deal or like just sort of like basic mechanics of it. And like people, you know, I, I don't write a lot about like the mechanics of like, you know, like M and A deal certainty because like no one cares except now they care. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's been fun for me. Um, but no, it's like mostly it's like things where I think I have some sort of specialized knowledge or just like a perspective that, uh, that is not sort of not the thing that everyone else is writing. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um, and when you say just pay attention to the internet, is it, uh, is it Twitter that you're monitoring? Is it all different news sources? Like it used to be like much more, much better about my RSS feed. Now my RSS, feed, it's like, I don't know. It's just like, it stopped being the way that people consume news, but it, you know, it's like Twitter, but it's all, it's mostly just like, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I write about is stuff that's on like the homepage of Bloomberg and the front page of the wall street journal. Like, I don't know, like today I wrote about, uh, this like insider trading case and in, in NFTs and like, like 20 people sent me that being like, in case you missed it, like, no, I didn't miss it. like, that's like, that, yeah. that gets to me. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, it's a lot of like sort of. It's it's rare for me to to like write about really arcane things that like aren't covered elsewhere, and when that does happen, it's most often people emailing it to me yeah. directly, like people being like, "You should check this out." Yeah, interesting. So um, I guess uh, well, in terms of all the success you had now, are you are there are there groupies that are coming up and stopping you on the subway like what is the recognition I mean, level like bit. today yeah like i would say that i'm recognized like you know a few times a year yeah, a few times a year really not like not like every day oh interesting mm -hmm. i uh maybe I would, like once a month i don't know yeah something like that, something like that. yeah that's the right ballpark i, I assume this these are m a lawyers or, or investment banking associates or uh, i guess venture capitalists kind of coming up to you and yeah it's like you know it's like Finance bros in Midtown. It's lawyers. Uh, I was I was at brunch on the Upper West Side with my with my parents a few weeks ago, and I was it's like an outdoor brunch, and I was recognized by a, a young lawyer. <laughs> my parents were were very puzzled by that. Yeah, that's funny. I uh, I have to I have to imagine. Hopefully, probably the amount of times you are recognized, I would hope that your readership is uh, not the not the groupie type to uh, go up and stop you and uh, you know try to get a selfie or something, but maybe that happens. I don't really mind that. I mean, like I'm I'm like not so famous that that's like intrusive, you know. Wait like, till this podcast airs, oh, sure, you know. Sure, yeah. yeah, shifting gears a little bit. Um, so you wrote a lot about the Wall Street bets and meme stocks and GameStop and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, now we've had a significant market pullback here uh, over the course of the last whatever four months. What, what do you think? Um, what do you think happens as a offshoot of all of that stuff? Like when we're looking back five, ten, fifty years from now, of all of those things that went on, do you think this is a blip in financial history? Do you think it marks meaningful regulatory change? What, what do you think the output of all this is? I don't know. I think that Wall Street bets. I think meme stocks is probably the thing that I've written about that I understand the least. Like where I feel like least confident in my views. Um, just because of the, it, it's like a whole bunch of social dynamics yeah. and yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I mean, like, first of all, I would put GameStop in like a context of like, I think I've written this like, like 10 years ago, if you said like, what is a stock worth? You'd be like, Oh, discounted cash flows. You know, like you'd like, you'd have some notion of like 
underlying fundamental value, right? And like, then like you come along and people, and you're like, well, what's a Bitcoin worth? And and people tell like these fundamental stories, right? Yeah. But like, essentially the story of like what a Bitcoin is worth is like, if it is broadly socially adopted as, as a store of value, then it's a very valuable store of value. And if it's not, it doesn't like generate cash, right? It's just like, a, it's like an entry on a computer ledger. Um, and, you know, there was like seven, five, seven years where like Bitcoin was like sort of, you know, in news stories and people were like, this is worthless. This is all a bubble that's going to go to zero. And I think people say that now, like some people do, I guess, but like, I don't think people really are like, oh, Bitcoin, like crypto is going to zero, right? So like you have this thing, it's like quite large class of financial assets that like are purely about or almost purely about or essentially about just like social adoption, just yeah. people saying we ascribe value to these things so they have value and in like a way that is like pretty robust. And like that's a huge change. I mean, it's not entirely in the sense that like you could say something similar about like gold, right? Yeah, the, but like that was a long time ago yeah, when gold yeah. became valuable, right? Yeah. Like, like you don't see a lot of things that that has happened to in the same way in the last, you know, 200 years or whatever. Um, and, uh, and like, that's a big sort of change in outlook. And like, I think to some extent, GameStop is a, uh, like meme stocks are a, um, offshoot of that where people are like, well, if like, if like what makes things valuable is essentially like groups of people on the internet describing value to them, then like, why not GameStop? Right. Um, like why can't we just get together in a chat room and make a stock go up and why, like, why is that less legitimate than any other reason any stock would go up? I think that's part of it. I don't think that's all of it. Right. I think there's a lot of like distrust of like the financial system and other things that went into it, but like that dynamic, um, like maybe that, like bubble that like that conceptual bubble has popped, but I don't really think so. Right? No, I mean, yeah. like crypto is still here. I'm um, like NFTs. Like I think there's there's been like a like that sort of meme driven value creation. Like some of the air has gone out of that. Yeah. But it's not gone, you know. Um, so I think that's the biggest like like sort of long term change. And I don't think it's about GameStop, but I think GameStop is a symptom of it. Um, regulatory stuff. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be anyone's priority to prevent a repeat of GameStop. You know, if you're like, oh, we're going to go from like T plus two to T plus one settlement, which is yeah, not yeah. like it's sort of an irrelevancy. I don't think, I mean, I, you know, I think that like, uh, the view of regulators is that bubbles happen and like you, you, you want to make the system robust to those bubbles, which I don't think, I don't think there's any systemic risk from GameStop, right? So you make the system robust to those bubbles and then people can, you know, make their own semi-informed decisions. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. What um, what about uh, I guess another topic you write about is uh, material non-public information and insider trading, sure. and uh, you wrote today about it in the context of uh, of NFTs and yeah. the the guy that was an employee of OpenSea front running um, things as they were posted to the website. What does insider trading even mean these days? Is it is it kind of an arbitrary thing that gets uh, litigated in? Case by no, case. I mean, I think there's like a, I think there is a sort of technical meaning that people don't find necessarily intuitive, but that leaving aside the open sea thing, I think it's, you know, I like to say it's, it's, it's trading on material non-public information, like information that matters to a stock or whatever. And that uh, is not generally public that you got in a bad way. Right. And like, it's like fairly well defined what in a bad way means. Like, if you are an executive of the company and you're trading on that company's information, like you have a fiduciary duty not to do that. If you're like an investment banker of the company or like the therapist of an executive of the company, you have some obligation to like the company or the insiders or whatever, not to, uh, not to use their information for your own purposes. And, uh, if you hack into the company's servers or like the, uh, you know, the press wire service servers and you steal the information, that's also a bad way and that counts. So like, you know, if you like got it in a way that like was nefarious and you trade on it, that's insider trading. And it's a st and if it's a stock. Now, the open sea thing is interesting because it's not a stock. And the prosecutors are taking the view that basically any sort of insider trading on material non public information about anything that you misappropriated from someone. If you had some duty of confidentiality and you traded on that confidential information, 
you know, not just the stock, but like commodity, non-fungible token, uh, real estate, anything, that's wire fraud. And so that's like a very broad expansion of insider trading. Whether they win with that and whether they uh, they pursue that into other areas, I don't know, right? I mean, like there's, there's a story a few years back when like Amazon was gonna, do, gonna open an HQ2 in New York. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like in Queens, I think. And, uh, and like some people bought up like, you know, real estate around where the headquarters are going to be. And there's a lot of talk about that being insider trading and, you know, under the, the open sea theory, that would be a crime too, even though it's not a securities crime. So I don't know. Uh, I do think that like, like the courts and the SEC have like a reasonably clear and consistent understanding of what insider trading is. But then I think a lot of the cases that are brought are sort of like unintuitive. Yeah. So, yeah, just because you bring up crypto, you had a funny uh, quote in an interview that I saw. You said, uh, I think DeFi is really cool, but actual uh, ventures makes me want to shoot myself. That's how stuff works, though. 90% fraud, 10% innovation. You said, the, you said the the ones who get into this space and succeed get rich, and the ones who get into this space and fail get hilariously rich. Do you think, like, does Web3, as we sort of talk about, and crypto and all this stuff... Do, do you view this as having a staying power that, you know, is going to persist beyond, you know, because it's kind of reached this flywheel? And does that pertain just to Bitcoin or is it NFTs? Where do, where do you think, like, on the spectrum of all this stuff we are and what's going to stay? I mean, I come from, like, the financial world and a lot of DeFi seems to be about sort of rebuilding a like like a like a financial system like a sort of system for like trading financial assets and like margining financial assets and whatever in a way that is in some ways more kind of like like sort of like refactored from like the way that you know just sort of like build it from the ground up in a way that is sort of like logical and uh and sort of open access and uh and like cool for nerds, you know, like, like it's yeah. a lot of, you know, it's people like, if I, you know, it's a lot of like the people who are like sort of programmers at traditional financial firms being like, if I were rebuilding the system from the ground up, how would I do it in a way that is like very like neat and intuitive. And I find that appealing, right? Like I'm like a financial nerd. Like I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Like that's like, I think that like some amount of it is done in a way that like, uh, devalues like certain like, real world, real world things about like, you know, like, like the way that like the way the financial system works where there's some amount of like, like the, like the biggest thing is that there is this belief that like smart contracts code is law, like everything will, you know, work exactly as coded and like, you never have to go to court and say, well, what we really meant was this, right? And like as a former lawyer, like, I don't buy yeah, that, yeah. right? But I think there's like some germ of like a, of like an intuition that like you could build a, sort of more decentralized automated financial system that would be cool you know and because it is cool it attracts a lot of like smart people who, who like who come from traditional finance firms and who would rather build something kind of from the ground up that is more like appealing intellectually um so i think that like nothing real happens you know like yeah it, it, every time i say it, like people go oh there's one th real thing over here but like it feels like not a lot real is happening but like in terms of building of infrastructure for trading, like it's cool. And so like eventually we'll, we'll trade some real stuff on it, right? Like, yeah. So I don't know. I think there's some staying power there. I'm not. But a, that market cap might be 10 billion or I have eight, no 50 idea. billion. Versus, I have no idea. I mean, I don't, like market cap, I feel like is, is almost the wrong metric, right? I mean, like if you can move like the trading of stocks to like some sort of. Decentralized. Some sort of system that looks more like crypto, right? Whether exactly what, like, whether it's on the blockchain or what, I don't know. But like, something that looks more like what crypto people are thinking about than something that looks like what Nicey currently does, then that would be, I don't know what like the market cap of that coin would be, right? But like, you know, the market cap of the stock market is enormous, yeah, right? Yeah, there'd be utility in that. You also did an interview with uh, Sam bankman fried on Odd Lots yeah, yeah. podcast recently. And uh, he was, I would say, fairly cynical in his portrayal of uh yield farming specifically but also just his tone around all this stuff was was 
uh, more negative than I think I would have expected for someone that's running one of the bigger crypto, uh, important crypto companies out there. Were you, were you surprised that, uh, like his tone and what he said about, see, I didn't experience it that way. I feel bad. Like I got Sam Backman for in trouble, but no, I, um, you know, like you mentioned like my tone of sort of like amused, like yeah. indulgence of like financial stuff. Like, I, like, first of all, that's how I took him. And secondly, like he is a person who I think of as like being interested in like the intellectual, like puzzle solving aspect of finance. And like, to some extent, like you sort of bracket what a coin is, for, what a, what a crypto coin is for. And you say like, well, you know, this is like the mechanics of how money goes in and out. And like, when you say that in a, in a certain amused way on a podcast to me and I'm like, so it's a Ponzi, like, he, like, is like, it could be a Ponzi. Right. So I think that he was like under, he was, um, giving very short shrift to the utility of some of like, of like the tokens that are used in yield farming because it was not relevant to the particular set of puzzles we were talking about. But like, but the, I don't mean that he like, like deep down believes that these things are saving the world. Like, I think he is like a guy interested in solving intellectual puzzles and like, you know, his, like his whole public posture is interesting, right? Because he's a, uh, he, like, he's, he's like making a lot of money running crypto to like write checks to effective altruism organizations. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, you don't have to believe in the underlying crypto to, to take their money. Oh yeah. Um, he, but he, he did, it did sort of feel like he was saying the quiet part out loud a little bit, uh, from, and maybe it was just, I, I know it was one part of a much longer interview, but, uh, but it was, it was interesting that he, um, even he wasn't trying to frame oh, it at a I, different I way. I just think that like, I just think that like, if you were to describe yield farming as like, you start this coin that like solves poverty and then you like stake it, right? Like, it's like, like yeah. Like that's you a can't lie. Yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah, a whole, yeah. like you start a coin that's a box. Yes, and then you stake it, and like more money comes out of the box. Listen, like, I found it. I found it refreshing, uh, <laughs> and I I was amused at it because you know one of the smartest people thinking about this stuff you know, said it the way that I don't know. I would I would jokingly kind of. But again, like it. I mean, the other thing I'd say is that like you know what I said about Bitcoin is like is like the sort of like centerpiece of a lot of this, which is that like the social acceptance of the value of these things drives the value of these totally. things in a, in a, in a naked way, right. Where it's not like, it's not like intermediated through like, well, it has cash flows. It's just like people accept it. It's, it's valuable. Right. And so like, that's like the premise of so many of these things, right. Yeah. It's the premise of Luna. It's the premise of yield farming, right? Like if you start from it having some value, then like you can build a lot of stuff off of it. And if you ask, why does it have some value? In the abstract, the answer is, ah, it doesn't, yeah. right? But like, that's just in the abstract, right? Like an individual project, you might be able to tell a better story, right? I mean, or you might not. I don't know. What about Elon? How, do, how does uh, someone you've written about quite a bit and someone that skirted, uh, you know, some of the SEC um, regulations and, and disclosures and all that, how do you think this Twitter thing ends for him from here? You've written that, you know, he can't really get out of it, right? Yeah, I, I I hate to speculate on this because like I think it will close and he will pay fifty four twenty a share for Twitter and like and like it doesn't seem that controversial to me, right? Like he hasn't said that he won't really ever, but certainly not in like the last week or two, right? Yeah. Um like he's he implied that he wouldn't, you know, that was a while ago and he's gone quiet and like moved on to other things and talked about how he's gonna own Twitter and like keeps like you know, doing the filings and doing, you know, proceeding with all the steps that required that are required to get the deal closed. And like, you know, there's no like regulatory impediment. The shareholders are going to vote. Yes. Like he has the money. Like it's fine. It was going to close this deal, but like it's trading at like 40 bucks a share. Totally. And a lot of people don't believe it's right. going to close. Just, and I don't fully understand why, but like their money's on the line. So like, I assume that they have some reason i just i don't and i don't understand it if you listen to his tone when uh when the all-in guys were interviewing him at their their conference i mean his tone would say and again this is one of those things if do you take elon literally or do you take him you know uh directionally in what he's saying but his tone and how he was talking about this definitely didn't seem like he intended to close now it sounds like they're yeah i mean my assumption is that he was sort of like 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 clearly like at that time, like clearly he was overpaying, right? Yeah. Like he, he put in a price that looked sort of like, right. Like 
good enough to get the board interested, but like not wildly overpaying. And then like, you know, the market collapsed and like Tesla collapsed. Yeah. So like his, he has less money than he did. And so now it feels like he's overpaying. And so he sort of like, like it seems to me that he floated a trial balloon of like, can I get away with talking some shit about Twitter and renegotiating the price? And it does feel like the answer was no, right? We're like, like people like me went on the internet to be like, no. And like Twitter was like, no. And so like, like I could be totally wrong. And he could be like, we're going to litigate this to the death and I will destroy Twitter unless they renegotiate it down to 45 bucks or, or I will walk away, you know? Um, but like my impression from like him stirring this shit up for like 24 hours and then dropping it is that it was sort of a trial balloon of like, can I get out of this? And the answer is kind of no. And then he dropped it. But I, 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 I cannot look into the man's head. Like I have no idea. So yeah. Yeah. How, how do you think all this SEC stuff, uh, plays out for him? I, I, you know, like he like very brazenly violated a number of like not very important rules yes. is the answer, right? Like, which is unfortunate, but like, like I think like they've, they've sent him a letter being like, why did you violate all these rules? And they will eventually send him a settlement agreement and he will maybe sign it and it will be like, he has to pay them some money and it will probably be a very, very, very large fine relative to historical fines for violating these rules. And, very, very small relative to like Elon Musk's net worth or yeah. like the price of Twitter or anything like that. Like they're not going to block him from like being a public they're not, they're not going to like arrest him, you yeah. know? Like, so it's just like, like, cause it's not that bad. And like, if it were anyone else, it wouldn't be that bad. And like, because he's like smirking while doing it and because he's constantly picking fights with the SEC, like it's very annoying, but like, it's just not that bad. Are you amused by it? Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. I got mad one day, but like for the most part. Yeah. Like, it's annoying. Like, you know, like as a former lawyer, I was like, you know, like I, I one likes the rule of law, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It'd be nice. And like, it's weird because like, like there are people who are like, oh, billionaires can get away with anything. But like, in fact, billionaires have lawyers. And like, if you are very, very rich, it just doesn't make sense for you to fill out this form late. Like, you, you have enough money to hire lawyers and not fill out the form late. And you, for the most part, like very rich people, like, like a public perception of them that is like, this is a upstanding, respectable citizen. Like this is a really like a good guy. Right. Like Elon Musk doesn't care. Right. And like, he likes the perception of him that is like, this is a guy who breaks the law a little yeah. bit. And like, that's very annoying. I don't know. Do you, uh, do you think that, this everything he's done is he one of one in the same way that i don't know trump donald trump seems to be one of one in terms of uh, elements of their fandom and their approach to running a company in politics or do you think this has permanently changed um corporate governance and g going forward for other other ceos other board members I, I think people draw lessons from him um yeah i'm i'm interested to know like what other uh what like the next sort of like private equity M and A agreement looks like, like whether the breakup fees will be much bigger, you know, like, like the, like he signed an agreement that like, looks like it should be pretty good. Like it should give Twitter a lot of comfort that he can't get out of it, but like they're squirming. Right. So like the next, next, next person selling a company is going to sign an even tighter agreement. Right. Yeah. Um, but probably even higher breakup fee. Yeah. But in terms of like how companies are run, like I, I, I think that, um, his like really full-time devotion to his persona is hard to replicate. But like, I do think people are drawing lessons in terms of like, I think like, like the one thing I would, I would say is like, you know, like I think that a lot of CEOs, you know, five years ago would have said like social media is like a pure downside risk. Like I can like get myself in trouble on Twitter, but I'm not going to like, you know, change the improve stock price the fortunes really of my yeah. company by tweeting. Right. And then you look at like Elon Musk hearing, like, Oh yeah, I could have like, you know, raised billions of dollars of equity at an enormous valuation by like having a fan base on Twitter. And I think people are, I think it is very hard to be Elon Musk, but I think if you look at like, you know, like Adam Aaron at, at, uh, at AMC is the sort of classic example of like a guy who's like, you know, Harvard college, Harvard business school, like sort of straightforward business executive. Who's like, I'm going to be a character on Twitter yeah. because that seems to be helpful for my stock price and for my ability to like raise financing. And like, it's worked out. Right. Yeah. And like, he's not Elon Musk, but he's like, 
I, I think there are, there are lessons that people, you know, beyond him are learning from Elon Musk. Certainly interesting. I, I guess as you look back over all of these things that you've sort of written about over the course of the last, whatever, couple of years since the pandemic, uh, since the pandemic occurred, was there anything that you just found totally unexpected and completely changed your mind on uh, having seen all these different machinations play out? Oh yeah, I mean, like, 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 I mean, GameStop just blew my mind. Like, yeah, it really, it's like the thing I don't understand. Like, I in in from a social dynamic standpoint, or just like throwing away the fundamental value yeah, like, of like, what things are worth, like the ability of um, retail investors to get together and dramatically move the price of a stock uh, for a long time. I had read like. You know, the, the year previous to that, like I had read, there's like a Business Week cover story about uh, like Wall Street bets, and it quoted people being saying that like if you buy call options, you can like make the stock of the price the, the price of a stock go up. And I was like, yeah, sure, but like not really. Like, the, yeah, the retail people buying call options is not really going to move the stock. You have to organize thousands and thousands yeah. of people willing to risk all their money. Like, like the stock market is sort of like a about institutional flows and like your your like you know Robinhood account just isn't going to have an effect on that and then like no I was wrong right yeah. like like you know GameStop just or you know the Wall Street bets just ran over like giant hedge funds in GameStop and uh and I wrote and I, people kept throwing this wrote back at me for like, still you know and like you know, like the first week of February of, of, of like uh, of 2021, like, you know, a week after the big GameStop uh, blow up, you know, the stock is at like, I don't know, 150 or whatever. And I was like, I tell you what, if we're still here in a month, I'm going to freak out. And we were there for like a year. Like, and it's still like, it's still, you know, up, you know, a thousand percent from where it was uh, at the beginning of January, 2021. Right. Um, and like the fundamentals might be better, but like, it's mostly, you know, like, like the, the staying power of like the meme stock, effect on a stock is, is just really striking to me. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I guess the impact it's actually had on the financial system for, I mean, you know, Melvin last week. Yeah. I don't think the impact on the financial system is that big, right? I mean, Melvin blew up, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's one hedge fund blew up, but I don't like, like people want there to be like systemic risks and like, you know, like Robin Hood had like a problem with its clearing broker. Sure, you know, with yeah, its, yeah. With its, that like, whole conspiracy. Clearing collateral. Yeah. Right, so people have a lot of conspiracy theories. And I think that like, some number of people on Wall Street bets would be like, the financial system almost crashed in January yeah, 21 yeah. because of- because But like, of, not really. But not really. We went right? from like, T like, minus two to, you yeah, know. Yeah, it's like, it's like, um, it's, it's not like, it's not like the world almost ended. It's just like my mental model of how stock prices work. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Well, it didn't bring down the financial system, but I have to imagine, I mean, I, I've, I've talked to friends that, that work at hedge funds, like the 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 risk appetite to go short sure. on stocks is right. very different today, or at least the consideration set of like, this wasn't a nuclear option that was even in people's right. Right. frameworks right. Right. at all. Right. Like, because again, like you, like the idea that some retail traders can move the price of a stock 10x and keep it there for as long as they want is is just not a thing that you would have thought. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's almost in some ways a manifestation. I know people compare Elon a, a lot to Donald Trump, but uh, there there's clearly things that are true in the world uh, that aren't necessarily reported in a meaningful way to the same extent that um, they've proven out, right? If you're just looking at the probabilities of these things happening, it would be almost negligible, right? But then they then they happen. Yeah. Uh, last one is there uh, is there anything that you've written about that um, we've probably forgotten about, but you still think is really interesting uh, and might manifest itself or show up at some point in the future again, and you y you still think about it in a meaningful way? No, I mean the things I like that I don't that that I feel like I don't talk about enough are like, um, you know, complicated structured traditional finance trades. You can just like. You know, like one day, like I started my career as a journal, as a whatever I do, as a blogger in 2011, which is a great time because uh, you're getting fallout from the financial crisis. And so all these like um, really complicated trades that were not like the guts of them were not made public. Like it wasn't like you got a prospectus that said this is how like these, you know, 
synthetic CDOs worked, like they were being made public in like post crisis like yeah, litigation yeah. and prosecutions and stuff. It's and like the Pentagon really papers of yeah, yeah, finance. It was really fun. And uh and then that sort of like that 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 sort of like died down and now like I'm hopeful that there are other like complicated horrors that are like lurking in a bank somewhere that like I will one day read about in litigation. But right now I feel like there's there's less of that and more like crypto blowups. I the odds are statistically that stuff mm. is probably going on deep in the the uh, parts of these financial institutions. So I trust you'll ha you'll have a long long time to have this market. Yeah. Uh, anything that we didn't hit? I don't think so. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. And that will do it for the 19th episode of Cartoon Avatars. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you to Matt Levine. Thank you to Packy McCormick. Thank you to Zach Weinberg, everyone for joining. Um, and as always, if you're enjoying this, feel free to uh, leave reviews. Um, feel free to subscribe, like all that good stuff. And uh, also feel free to comment so we can get Zach Weinberg to, to become a regular on this, uh, on this show. I think he's a real crowd favorite. And uh, yeah, it's really fun to have him on as well. And, and so thanks everyone for joining this week. Look forward to, uh, to seeing everyone next week. Mm -hmm.